So my name is Sarah Johnson. I am a graduate student at the University of Illinois. I am also the vice president and the communications chair for the Champaign County Audubon Society. And, you know, of course, we are not able to do any programs right now. Our Sunday morning bird walks are on hold and we miss everybody. So we wanted to try to create some different opportunities for people to learn about uh, the outdoors, learn about native plants, about birds that are traveling through the area. And hopefully you guys have gotten a chance to get outside, go exploring, and see what types of birds are arriving during migration. Um, so this presentation is going to be a little different. It's definitely bird focused, but it's focused more on how to encourage wildlife to your backyard. And I'm by no means an expert. So, you know, if you have uncertainty about some of the things that I'm saying, please feel free to do some additional research. You know, I don't know. Um, I'm not traditionally trained in horticulture, although I do have, you know, a decent amount of experience. I've had a garden for as long as I can remember. And, um, you know, I like learning a lot about the natural interactions between plants, insects, and that food web that, that we expect to see in some of our backyards. So today I'm not really going to be talking so much about how to design a garden or how to maintain a garden, but it's going to be more of a discussion of why it's important to consider wildlife of all types uh, when you're designing your landscape. Because, you know, as human dominated landscapes expand across the whole world, you know, these birds, these butterflies and the critters that we love are left with fewer places to call home. And Doug Tillamy, author of Bringing Nature Home, which is an incredible book I recommend you read, uh, has pointed out that we have already turned 54% of the lower 48 states into cities, suburbs, and an additional 41% of our land has been turned to various forms of agriculture. New development continues to take up about 2 million acres of prime wildlife habitat per year. And when you add to that, the remainder of that land, invasive species, polluted water sources, uh, air quality, you know, our progress as a species can, can really have some far reaching consequences. And the good news is that gardening and giving up that traditional landscape of a yard is for the most part, you know, becoming trendy again. Hopefully people are considering getting rid of some of their lawns, using less pesticides and herbicides. Um, and there's a lot of information in the news about monarch waste stations, you know, saving pollinators, using um, habitat in our urban landscape that's usually unused and transforming that into quality habitat. So city parks, using road strips and right of ways as potential habitat. And this is all really, really good news. Um, it's gonna help us coexist with these creatures that we've tried to push out for so long. And homogenizing our landscape it has never been good for anybody, including us. Um, that diversity, <laughs> oops, I don't know, I have little points on the screen, but hopefully that'll go away. Um, you know, a lot of these species have actually gotten a lot better at learning to deal with, with some of our urbanization, which is a good thing. You know, foxes, coyotes, a lot of birds, you know, they, they can um, really thrive in these hybrid ecosystems that we create. So today we're going to highlight some of the things that you can do to help encourage a thriving ecosystem in your backyard, in your community, in your local parks, and not only just encourage wildlife, but also make a beautiful space that you can enjoy. So we may be primarily interested in bringing a variety of birds to our backyard, many of the ones we see here. But we know that nature is complicated and it consists of more interactions than we can imagine. So by choosing the right plant species, providing diverse food resources, encouraging beneficial insects, and sometimes just embracing the mess of a less kept garden can really greatly increase the diversity in our backyards. Some of these birds here are residents, some of them are migrants, um, but I, I've often had a lot of people ask me, you know, I've put a bird feeder out in my backyard and I don't know what's going on, but I don't see a lot of birds. And part of that reason could be that if there's kind of a barren landscape otherwise, um, but you do have food in the yard, um, there's not those other resources. They may not have a water source or a place to shelter. They may be fearful of coming to a feeder that's open and, um, 
at risk of predators. So there's a lot of things to think about. And, you know, a lot of these birds, particularly if they're migrating, have traveled really, really long distances. And when they come here, they're looking for kind of a sanctuary, a respite, somewhere they can rest safely, um, unbothered, and gain resources to kind of rebuild their energy levels. So, you know, imagine you're one of these birds, these migratory songbirds, and you've spent your entire winter um, in the tropics or somewhere really warm, you know, Central South America, uh, warm, lush, humid, and mostly important food packed environment. So there's very little competition in places like the tropics where there's not intense seasonal uh, weather when it comes to temperature change. Um, you know, there's a lot of food resources in the way of nectar, uh, in the way of insects. And so there's not as much competition. And then you're flying over through the migratory flyway and you come across this town and you're like, well, let's see, is this a good place to stop? Let me, let me look around. Um, you know, we've got some segmentation here. We've definitely got a lot of trees, which, you know, go Champaign-Urbana for, for having quite a lot of trees. Uh, we have some stream and river corridors. Uh, we've got some really nice natural areas like preserves in the surrounding area of central Illinois. But when it comes to town, you can see that this is really a patchwork of habitat. We've got a lot of open grass, a lot of buildings. Um, it's not necessarily as welcoming to birds as the previous slide, of course, right? But they've got to come through. They've got to make it through. A lot of these birds um, breed up north. And so they have to find ways to persist and, and find resources along the way. And so by improving habitat in a lot of areas I can see would be really good potential in this landscape. You know, transforming some of the lawns, um, creating some green infrastructure in some of the urban areas, um, or even improving habitat in your own backyard would really, um, you know, provide a mix of the things that are needed to help maintain those healthy ecosystems. And this is just a, a, a mock-up of a garden that I think has a lot of good examples of some of those critical aspects. And it doesn't have to look like this. You know, of course, this has a lot of non-native plants and not real plants in it. Um, but I think it's a really good outline of a lot of the different areas you can include in your yard. This yard provides food, it provides water, it provides shelter. And it's a really great example of how to mix aesthetic and also substance for these critters. So we have an equal mix of wild space. Um, we also have maintained spaces like mowed lawn. Um, we also have you know, some com combination of man-made structures and some natural structures for shelter. So we've got, um, someone asked what a water butt is. That is uh, just a water barrel. So a rain barrel, essentially. Um, we've got, you know, beautiful compost heap, which a lot of uh, ground nesting bees use over the winter to overwinter. We've got bug hotels. We've got a nice uh, brick wall or rock wall there, which is great for insects, also good for snakes and other animals. Uh, we've got a mini meadow and a bee lawn, which are really crucial for some of those surfid flies, um, some smaller bees. Um, we've got structure in the back in the form of trees and flowering shrubs. Those not only provide food resources, but they also provide shelter, kind of a protected border so that if a bird is hanging out in the yard, they have a place to go hide. Um, you know, we also have some wild areas like a, like a prairie patch or, um, you know, manicured uh, garden. And another thing is, is having those various levels of vegetation are going to provide habitat for all different types of insects, which is then going to increase your bird population. So one thing in particular is lawns aren't very good for a lot of insects. Um, there's no floral or nectar resources. There's no shelter. Um, you know, even, and also mulching every square inch of your yard isn't necessarily beneficial either. Sometimes you want to have bare patches of ground for ground nesting bees. Um, you know, increase the biodiversity within your soil. So there's a lot of things to think about, but part of this is, again, doing a little less work, which most people you would think would want. And by doing that, you're improving the habitat in your own backyard. Um, you know, and I also like the idea of a pond or an aquatic feature. You know, in our backyard, we have a place where the sump pump dumps water. And as you guys can see with the amount of rain, it is very full right now. And so we have a, a native 
native plant rain garden that we put in the backyard a couple of years ago. Whoops. And it is really, really happy. Um, it's loving the amount of rain that we have. It's, it's really happy. And we have plants that enjoy wet soils. Um, they thrive there. And by planting them there, they actually will help pull up you know, some of that water and re use that as a resource and then leave less water in your soil so it's less inundated. Um, you know, dead, dead uh, wood, brush piles, which is great for bugs, lots of roly polies and beetle larvae, things like that, things that birds really love. And what's really cool is if you provide all of these basic habitat elements, you can actually get your yard certified as a wildlife habitat, which, you know, may not seem like a big deal, but having this network can really show places on a map where there is lack of habitat or lack of certified wildlife habitat. There's something like this through the National Wildlife Federation. There's also something similar through the Illinois Audubon Society. Um, there's, there's various different resources, National, um, National Wildlife Federation, but there's also, there's a couple more. And um, I think it really includes, you know, planting some native plants, providing food, water, cover, and nesting locations for birds. And also those are really beautiful um, gardens that I think anyone would love to have at their home. And they include natives in both a kind of wild way. In the left, you have a little bit more of a wild prairie. And then on the right, you have a little bit more manicured landscape that both are equally as beautiful. All right, so where to get some of these native plants, right? Well, unfortunately, not a lot of nurseries have caught up to customer demand of native plants. So fortunately, you can buy some native plants from some of our local organizations like Illinois Native Plant Society, Grand Prairie Friends, and I will have a list of some of those resources at the end of this presentation. But most nurseries have not really embraced this. And I find that very unfortunate, but I do think that the only way that we are going to get this to be a little bit more widespread is by putting pressure on these nurseries to offer better, um, better options. Fortunately, um, there are some plants that you can find more readily at local nurseries and, and plant nurseries. And I guess the first question would be, why do you want to plant native plants? And there's so many reasons. Um, the first reason I usually give people is that there's less upkeep. You know, they're more resistant to climate and moisture regimes in this area. They also have a long evolutionary history with their animal counterparts and with the, with the ecosystem and the soil that we have here. So there's less upkeep. You have to water them less. You usually don't have to baby them or care for them after the first year as long as they're established and as long as we don't have any intense droughts. Um, there's, they're also just they're going to attract more insects than annuals and non-native perennials, especially if you're looking to encourage animals or insects that want to have babies, you know, want to lay their eggs on these different plants. And um, really some of these are options that you're more likely to find at a nursery. So a lot of times you'll find plants that are more cultivars or um, varieties of some of these natives, I usually encourage you to continue searching if you find a native var or a cultivar, they call them. And the reason is, is that if someone has native plants nearby, there is the possibility of hybridization, muddying up the genetics kind of, of local nearby populations. Um, it's not normally a problem for people in urban areas, but my opinion is, is if, if you can get the species type, it's always going to be better for insects and wildlife than the non-native cultivar or the uh, variety. And so the ones that I've highlighted on this screen are uh, Liatris pycnostachia, which is a prairie blazing star, one of the probably most popular Liatris species, although there are many. Um, Aspera um, Newlandii is a really lovely one that I have in my front yard. It gets like 10 feet tall and the monarchs love it. Um, also Asclepius tuberosa, which is uh, probably one of the showier and more commonly found milkweeds. But of course, there's also swamp milkweed. There's common milkweed, uh, which can be, some people find it a little weedier, gets kind of tall. And also um, there's, I mean, there's just so many species of milkweed in Illinois. It's, uh, there's too many for me to name. I have a whole poster in my sunroom of different types of milkweed. There's verticillata, there's 
um, purple milkweed, and they're all beautiful. Um, if you can find them, I recommend planting a variety of them because they're all good in different locations. For example, butterfly milkweed's kind of a generalist, but it prefers sandy, dry soils, but swamp milkweed really would love to be in your rain garden. Um, you know, so there's some that grow everywhere. Um, we've also got uh, Solidago canadensis, Canada goldenrod. Now, I do see a comment from Kathy, of course, this is true. Yeah, Canada goldenrod is not the ideal um, goldenrod variety or species. It's one that will probably pop up in your yard without you even asking um, because the seeds just carry so far. And I, I would say if you can control a section of it, um, you know, I have one that pops up every year next to my fence out front and I just trim it back and, um, you know, trim some of the seeds back at the end of the year so it doesn't continue to spread. I mow around it or trim other stems that continually pop up. Um, but I like to keep that as a variety because it, it is pretty persistent. It grows really strongly. And at the end of the year, at the end of summer and early fall, it's, it's a really good nectar pollen plant. Um, so I usually recommend keeping it around. But of course, there are, again, many, many different species that you can plant. Um, there's stiff goldenrod, which is Solidago rigida. There's um, elm-leaved goldenrod, there's zigzag goldenrod, and they're all really beautiful. I have many of them in my backyard and recommend all of them. Again, all go in different locations. So if you have a wet area, a dry area, um, they can be planted wherever you need them to go and they will look beautiful. Um, and for some of the less weedy types, I would say definitely leave the seed heads on. The birds will enjoy them all through the winter. They'll leave structure and something interesting for you to look at during a really drab and dreary winters. Um, and of course, the last one is uh, purple coneflower. Again, multiple different species of echinacea. We have purpurea, which is purple uh, coneflower. Uh, we also have um, pale purple coneflower, which is really lovely. Um, there's, there's many different varieties of these plants and species of these plants that you can plant in your yard. They're going to be great pollen and nectar resources. They're going to, some of them provide host uh, plant, you know, tissue for some of these insect species. We all know about milkweeds and monarchs, um, but a lot of other butterflies and um, beetles, you know, surfid larvae, things like that, they all feed on the tissue of these plants. So any of these are really important to keep around. And you may find that by planting some of these, you find insects in your yard you didn't even know existed before you planted them, which is uh, really, really exciting. So these are some you'll more commonly find. For others that I recommend that are a little less common, but still somewhat prevalent in, in garden centers, uh, two of these, um, the cardinal flower and the white turtle head, for example, do very well in my rain garden. I have actually two species of lobelia. I have the purple, um, the blue lobelia, I think it's syphilitica, and lobelia cardinalis, which is the bright red one that people love to plant for hummingbirds. The truth is hummingbirds love all different types of plants as long as they have great nectar resource. So they are more drawn to red. But they'll of course also go to purple, go to blue, go to white. Um, but anything with that, you know, these are kind of species that provide a really good nectar resource. Um, white turtle head, Chelone glabra, is doing great in my rain garden. Um, you can see by the structure of that, it has kind of a little ramp and it's perfect for bumblebees. They kind of wedge themselves in into that hood of the flower, get in there, and they reach down and grab that nectar. So some of the smaller bees can just get right in there, um, but if you're a really big bumblebee, you know, maybe you're not gonna be a specialist on a turtle head. Um, what's also cool is it is the host plant for the Baltimore checker spot, which is a um, listed species. So by planting this, you never know, you could get a Baltimore checker spot in your yard, and um, I, I doubt it, but it would be really cool if, you know, by planting some of these plants, you could encourage some of these rare and threatened species to your yard. Um, another that is pretty common in our prairie ecosystems, Oswego tea or Monarda fistulosa, um, is, is a really common, easy to propagate from either seed or from a cutting. Uh, they do very well in gardens in different habitats, so in shade or in uh, sunny areas. I have one right next to my doorway. So every time I walk out there in the, in the summer, it's just swarming with small bees, small native bees and flies. Um, and the nectar tube tells you a lot about what different insects are able to get in or not get into that nectar tube. So, you know, there's short tongue bees, long tongue bees, um, various uh, butterflies have lengths of 
uh, proboscis. So there's also nectar robbers. So there's some bees that can't reach down into the bottom of a flower. And so they bite a hole through the bottom and they suck the nectar out that way. Um, it's really a really cool thing to observe in your garden. Um, but yeah, this is a prolific seeder. It provides good resources all year round. And uh, I definitely would recommend it um, for your garden. And another cool thing is this bee species up on the top right is a, um, you know, an interactive species with the Monarda fistulosa. It's actually called Dufaria monardae after the Monarda, and it specializes on this uh, type of flower, which is really cool. So some of the birds you may attract to your yard by providing nectar resources. Uh, we've got a Baltimore Oriole feeding on probably an apple or a cherry of some sort, something in the Rosaceae family. Uh, we've also got a Cape May warbler, which is a really stunning neotropical migrant making its way through the Midwest right now. And it is sitting on a pawpaw, which um, I'm actually, you know, I put this up here and I'm actually not sure that pawpaw provides nectar. I know that it, it is kind of stinky. It attracts flies as a pollinator. And so what it probably does is more so mimic a carrion flower um, where it's a little smelly. Um, and that's how it gets pollinated. So I'm not sure if it's actually, if the bird's there for the nectar or if it's there for the bugs, but either way, it attracts flies and beetles. Uh, we also have a uh, hummingbird, ruby-throated hummingbird here, feeding on a wild columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. Again, you've got that nice long nectar spur, uh, beautiful red color, and these are plants that usually do well in your yard for a couple of years, and then you have to reinvigorate them with seed or new plant but they do well in a variety of different uh, temperature and moisture regimes in your yard. Uh, something we may not think about as nectar is sap, uh, but yellow-bellied sap suckers will drill holes in the, uh, drill wells in the side of a tree. Probably many of you have looked at a tree and said, wow, that's a really odd, perfect circle of, of holes around this tree. I wonder what that's from. Well, it's from a very, very cute woodpecker called the yellow-bellied sap sucker. And I've actually seen hummingbirds and different birds go up to those sap sucker wells and eat the sap that's coming out of those wells. Um, and insects go up to it as well. So very cool. And then on the bottom here, we've got a, a Tennessee warbler who um, I believe is again eating out of the flowers of probably a, a apple or a, a rosace, rosaceous plant. Um, so not only herbaceous plants, but trees and shrubs can provide a lot of nectar resources too, and I think are often overlooked. Even the flowers of something like an oak or um, a maple, you know, provide some of those resources for birds. So some different plants that provide fruit. Uh, we've got the common elderberry, which is probably most popular, known for its edible uh, berries that you can make wine with. Um, you can use the flowers. Uh, it's very, very delicious, but do not eat the rest of the plant because it is very toxic. Um, but the berries are super important for a variety of birds like, um, you know, chipmunk, well, chipmunks too, uh, turkeys, doves, grosbeaks, um, catbirds, you know, any of these shrubby fruiting plants are going to be a better representation of what birds need than our non-natives like autumn olive or honeysuckle. So if you have some of those in your yard, considering cutting them, getting them out and replacing them with something that's a really good native shrub. Um, you know, variety of beetles, bee flies, longhorn beetles are often found visiting these bright white flowers. Um, they'll eat the leaves, they'll eat the flowers, and any of the hollow stems that are left behind at the end of the year, I usually say just leave them because they provide great overwintering and nesting habitat for mason bees, carpenter bees. Um, so they will create little sections of tubes to lay their eggs in and raise their young. Um, but it does kind of provide, you know, a shrub-like form. So if you, if you have the room for it, let it get big. Um, We've also got Virginia creeper, Parthenocystis cinquefolia, which I think is another one that's kind of overlooked and considered a little bit weedy, but I don't know how you can't love this plant. It's so beautiful. It's got these bright red leaves in the fall. Um, you get these, it, mine's actually about to bloom right now, um, which turn into these blueberries, which are not edible, so do not eat them, but um, they do provide food for birds and other animals. Um, so I, I love this plant. It's great for an area of your yard that you kind of want something to just ramble or to go along a fence. Um, and that color is just really great in fall. 
Um, also the downy service berry, which is one of my favorite tree shrubs uh, because it's beautiful all year. In the spring, it provides these lovely white fluffy flowers, um, has green bright foliage during the summer with the red berries, which usually get gobbled up really quickly by cedar waxwings, robins. Um, but you can eat them. They're edible. They just have kind of a lot of seed. I know we've tried to make uh, fruit leather from them before and they were very seedy, um, but they are edible. And then in the fall, they're gorgeous too. They have orange, deep orange foliage and they just look really wonderful. Um, and those dried berries, if any are left at the end of the summer, can provide food during the winter for birds that are traveling through, um, like kind of our, our resident birds, um, even robins who stick around and will kind of chop down those berries when they find them. And what's really cool, it is the host plant for a variety of moth species, including this guy here. This is the blue spring moth, Lomographa semiclarata, just so cute. I've personally, I don't believe I've ever seen one. Um, but of course, I believe that the service berry in our yard is probably a cultivar or something of the like. So I'm not sure if it's actually, you know, a host, a host species. I have seen um, uh, mantid uafecas, like little egg cases for them in the, in the tree, which is cool. So. And any time you provide fruit or berries, you're going to get some of these birds in your yard. Of course, the American robin, which again is, I think a lot of people think of robins as the first bird of spring, but I actually, um, I think of red-winged blackbirds as the first bird of spring because they arrive and it is like, it's official, it's on. Um, but robins will, what they call latitudinally migrate. So they will kind of form these big groups um, and troops during the winter and they travel looking for, you know, fruiting trees. Um, they will eat seeds and other things, but they can't find as many insects during the winter, of course, but they don't totally migrate. They don't really leave the area. They just kind of wander around latitudinally looking for, um, you know, various places to eat. Uh, we've also got cedar waxwings, which are a personal favorite. I think they're, both these photos, they're feeding on mountain ash. Um, We've also got a horned lark in the bottom right corner. I'm not sure what kind of berry it's eating. Maybe something in the vaccinium tribe, like blueberries. Um, either way, uh, a cool bird species that we typically see out in our uh, flood, uh, flooded um, agricultural fields, in our cornfields and soybean fields. Um, they're fairly common grassland bird that I, I really adore and don't see that often, actually. Uh, in the middle here, we've got a pine grosbeak, which is more common here during the winter. They come down in the winter and then go back up north during the summer. Um, not sure what it's feeding on, actually. It could be something like a, a cherry or a, I'm, I'm actually not sure. Um, and then the bottom left, we've got an eastern tohi eating one of my favorite shrubs, the service berry. We've got some more here. The um, black cap chickadee up on the top left eating some sumac berries, native shrub that's really loved by birds, bluebirds I see often at sumacs. Uh, we've got a um, northern mockingbird feeding on probably some winterberry or uh, an ilex species like holly, uh, a white-throated sparrow at a dogwood. Uh, we've got a cardinal feeding on mulberry. Now a lot of the mulberries we have around town are uh, what are the Turkish mulberries, so they're non-native. Um, they can get a little weedy, a little spread a little bit too much. If you can replace it with a native mulberry, great. But for example, we just keep ours really, really hard pruned. And uh, we've actually tried to like espalier it across the back of the garage so that it forms a better habit and doesn't get super weedy. But the birds do love it. So it's kind of hard to um, justify getting rid of it completely as long as you can keep it contained. Um, we've got an Eastern bluebird feeding on some holly berries. And then one of my favorites is in the middle here, this is a yellow rumped warbler. And I think a lot of people don't consider this plant a very good food plant. Um, do we have any guesses of what this plant is? Okay, I don't see anyone chatting yet, but it is, um, it is a poison ivy bush. So the berries are this white color. Yep, good job, Jackie. Um, the white berries are not good for us, of course, but birds, they're really immune to a lot of these issues that humans face when it comes to eating things. So um, they are not sensitive to the urtic urticaceous berries. Um, they're not sensitive to anything that's like spicy 
or astringent really. So a lot of the things that we would think are very untasty are very tasty to them. Not that I'm saying I recommend planting poison ivy in your yard, but if you have some, you don't have kids or dogs that are gonna run out there and run into it, um, and you can keep it in a place where it's away from you, just, just let it go. It's a great food plant for birds. All right, some other plants that provide seeds, nuts, fruit. Um, these are all shrubs or trees. We've got American persimmon, which is just a great plant um, that I don't see often enough, personally. Diospyros virginiana. It's visited by at least 10 different types of bees, including cuckoo bees. Insects like longhorn beetles feed on the foliage and the wood. Um, the fruit is great for birds and mammals that play a really valuable role in dispersing and stratifying those seeds. So when they eat the, the fruit, it uh, goes through their stomach and their gut, and the acid in their stomachs will stratify those seeds or break that seed coat and make them more readily germinable. So they'll poop them out in a nice, perfect compost packet wherever they land, and um, you know then that seed is, is better able to germinate because it's um, breaking down the seed coat of that seed. Um, if you would like to try to eat American persimmon, <clears throat> I know there is one at Meadowbrook Park, kind of near the herb garden, um, but you do want to eat them when they are very ripe, like almost to the point where they're smushy because they are very astringent and will taste really bitter and sour if they're not ripe. So it's really good to eat them after a frost, actually. Um, but it's the only member of the ebony family in Illinois, which I just think is super cool. But if you buy one, you want to make sure you buy both a male and a female. They should be labeled if you buy them at a reputable tree nursery, um, or you kind of just roll the dice and see what happens. Um, but they won't bear fruit if you don't have a male and a female. Um, there may actually be some new varieties that, you know, are consistently fruiting. I'm not sure. I'm not up on the pers persimmon trade, but you never know. Okay, so also we've got um, the American elm, which is unfortunately probably best known for its unsuccessful battle with the Dutch elm disease introduced and transmitted by the European elm bark beetle. And this tree provides food for both the common and question mark butterflies, as well as a variety of other species of moths and aphids. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers love it for the sap. Um, the seeds provide food for lots of birds, including finches, curry chickens, uh, which are, are not, uh, you know, a listed species in Illinois, and many birds such as red-shouldered hawks and vireos really like these trees when, when tall for uh, nesting habitat. Another favorite shrub of mine, this is a great one to plant if you don't have a ton of room. Um, Spicebush stay relatively small, and it's a great shrub to have in your yard. Turns a beautiful yellow in the fall, has these red, red fruits on it, um, which are kind of a peppery taste. Um, they attract lots of different birds, including um, woodland game birds, if you live near a natural area, like grouse, bobwhite, pheasants, um, who all play a major role in dispersing those seeds. Very similarly to the persimmon, they, they help stratify that seed when they pass it through their gut. And uh, the shrub's also a host plant for multiple butterfly and moth species, like the spicebush swallowtail and promethea moths, which are huge moth species um, that sometimes you may see in this area and are really beautiful. And lastly, some other trees that provide a lot of resources. Um, hopefully you have a lot of these in your yard. Again, I'm really proud that Champaign-Urbana has a ton of tall, beautiful groves of trees. Um, one of the most important is the shagbark hickory, Caria ovata, and it's a very important food species for mammals such as the flying squirrel, white-footed mice, raccoons, um, it's also an important food species for a variety of insects like leafhoppers, which are one of the coolest insects, I love them, um, provides important roosting habitat for the federally endangered Indiana bat, and um, another favorite bird of mine is the brown creeper, which is here over the winter. Um, they use the tree for nesting and overwintering. Um, they like to use that flaky bark kind of as like a protection and cover, but the bark also provides important winter habitat for lots of insects and so it attracts a lot of woodpeckers, birds that are looking for a snack over the winter when there's not a lot of insects available. Um, they kind of dig out underneath those pieces of bark or even flick them off the tree and find insects that way. Um, and white oaks are extremely important. They are the state tree um, and they are a mast species. They provide a valuable nut crop for birds and mammals. 
Uh, blue jays are a major disperser of acorns because they take them and they cache a lot of them and many of them they don't come back for, uh, just like squirrels do. So they leave them and then those will germinate and create new trees. And as many as 70 different gall making organisms have been found on a single white oak tree, which is really incredible. Um, this one shown on the right here is called a hedgehog gall, one of my favorites because it's fuzzy and, and weird looking. And the gall is formed when this wasp here um, will lay an egg in the tissue of a leaf. So they put their ovipositor under the tissue of the leaf and then um, they put in, insert their eggs and then this tiny little nursery forms around those eggs and creates a small habitat for them to essentially uh, grow and form protected from the elements. Of course, birds do sometimes find these galls, they peck into them and pull the larva out, but um, I'm sure many of them survive just fine. Uh, so they do feed migratory birds. Uh, these predatory wasps will control pest populations. They're really wonderful to have in your landscape. Um, there's so many different species that depend on this plant. I, it would be impossible for me to, to list them all. But some of the birds you can hope to find um, by planting seed producing trees in your yard are uh, blue jays here with an acorn, uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, which have made their way to town, um, are really beautiful migratory birds. That's um, feeding on locust seeds at Horicon Marsh, which is not too far away. Uh, common redpole, another bird that comes through during the winter. Uh, we've got a American goldfinch eating some seeds of our native prairie plant, uh, Silphium perfoliatum, which is a cup plant. Uh, can get a little weedy. I have a few in my backyard. Um, I wish the birds would eat more of the seeds so <laughs> that they didn't spread. But it's a really lovely plant if you have a place to put it in a controlled, controlled area. Um, and my favorite bird on the bottom left is one of our uh, game birds in Illinois. It is the northern bobwhite. They are essentially a chicken, but they are so cute and um, travel in little groups. And they like that edge habitat, um, grassland habitat. Really, really lovely birds. Um, so real quick, I'm just going to scan through some other cool interactions. You know, we've got northern sea oats provide seeds and in, in winter interest. Uh, a favorite Baptisia of mine is cream wild indigo. Uh, attracts different um, weevils, which I do love weevils. Um, northern sea oats is a food plant for the northern pearly butterfly. Also, I think many people probably don't think of grasses as being a good um, host plant, but they indeed are. Um, sand coreopsis is a little more uncommon. Um, we also have prairie and tall coreopsis, but the bees really love this plant and uh, it feeds a lot of moths, um, moths and moth caterpillars as well. Here are some birds that you will attract to your yard if potentially if you um, introduce a lot of insects to your yard or you have a good healthy uh, insect ecosystem. Got a grasshopper sparrow here, indeed eating a grasshopper, which is pretty satisfying. Uh, a northern flicker in the center. Uh, they can often be seen like foraging on the ground. Um, so if you leave some areas with some vegetation or some uh, leaves at the end of the year, um, they like burrowing through that leaf matter to try to find grubs and insects. Uh, we've got a black-billed cuckoo on a tent caterpillar nest. Not many birds like to get into a tent caterpillar nest, but many will try. Um, that sticky web definitely will get all over their face and is super hard to get off, but um, provides a bonanza of food if you can get in there. Uh, Eastern kingbird uh, feeding on a dragonfly, and then a super cutie on the bottom left loggerhead shrike, and uh, shrikes are very cool predatory birds. They will snatch insects out of the air. Not only do they eat them right away, but they also will cache them and store them for later. So this guy has impaled his victim on a barbed wire fence, and he'll either eat it now or he'll eat it later. Um, it's pretty cool to see shrikes, you know, leaving a little totem of their victims. Um, they're just really, really cool birds that I wish I saw more of in the area. Other birds that eat insects, uh, people probably don't think of owls as eating insects very often, but here's a picture of a short-eared owl chowing down on a sphinx moth, uh, all of the powder of those wings in its wake. Um, we've got in the middle a summer tanager uh, eating a probably a wasp. Um, lots of birds eat wasps even though they are stinging and a little bit risky. 
Uh, we've got a chimney swift on the top right, and those are just so cool because they just gather insects right out of the air with that giant mouth, and they're actually able to scoop water off the surface too um, to get water while they're in flight. Bottom right, we have a pine warbler feeding its young some delicious insects. And then on the bottom left, we have a, I believe it's a Louisiana water thrush um, with some caterpillars and crane flies in its mouth, probably going to feed its young. And um, I think what's an important point before I continue is that a lot of um, birds will change up what they eat um, during the year. So of course they eat whatever is abundant at the time, but when birds switch over to feeding their young, they primarily will provide insects. And that's why insects are so important to birds. Um, Insects provide that fatty, protein-rich resource for their young. Um, so they, they will often eat seeds and fruit in the fall when they're available. They'll eat nectar, flowers, insects in the spring when they're available. Um, so they vary their diet based on, of course, what's available, but also um, what's important at the time. So when you're migrating and you're traveling, you need a lot of sugar for that instant energy. You need a lot of fat to carry you through. Um, so in the fall, having that fat-rich resource of seeds and fruit is really important to not only put on fat for the winter so that you can, um, you know, survive the winter and get through those hard times, but also to put on fat. So if you have to travel incredible distances, you know, you have that reserve as a backup when it's challenging to find food until you get to somewhere that's a little more resource-rich. Okay, so just another list of some other species I definitely recommend. I'm not going to go through them all, but um, they range from herbaceous plants to trees and shrubs, um, particularly a weed that I, I let a couple of grow in my yard is pokeweed. Um, it's, it's definitely weedy, um, and it will leave purpley poop, uh, purpley pink poops all over your yard, but um, it's, a, it's a really cool plant. It's just a neat looking plant. Um, and here's another one of those Asclepias species, the world milkweed, Asclepias verticillata, on the bottom right. Um, and to just skim through some of these um, beneficial bugs, you know, the host interaction is just a really cool um, thing to think about. You know, the fact that these plants and insects have evolved for a really long time to use each other. So, you know, pipe vine swallowtails, for example, um, depend on the pipe vine, um, du uh, woolly Dutchman's pipe, Aristolochia tomentosa. We have one in our backyard along the fence, and we not only get a lot of different insects visiting the flower, um, they kind of have that carrion flower stinkiness to them, so they attract flies, beetles, gnats, um, but the foliage of the plant is really important for um, the pipe vine swallowtail. So we planted ours maybe three, four years ago, and the first year didn't do much, um, second year didn't do much, and then the last two years it's been doing excellent. Um, it's very large, grows really quickly, and now it's taken over a couple areas of our fence, and we have tons of flowers, and every year we um, are shocked that we see uh, a hefty sized um, brood of pipe vine swallowtails on our plant because there's not a lot of these in the area, I can't imagine. Um, and there's not a lot of substitute plants. So whatever it is, this, these butterflies are able to navigate and find these plants and lay eggs on them, which is just truly incredible. And they're just such cute little caterpillars. I love them. Uh, Bluewood aster, which is a kind of common aster species that you can uh, plant in your yard, uh, feeds the silvery checker spot, a very cool butterfly species. It's also great for leaf mining bugs. Um, aphids, leaf hoppers. Now a lot of people might say, why would I want aphids in my yard? Aphids are not great. Well, the reminder is everything in balance, right? So if you have aphids in your yard, hopefully you will also have lots of ladybugs, you'll have lots of lace bugs, and those will help keep those insects in check. So surfid larvae, so surfid flies, um, they lay eggs on the plant and surfid larvae travel up and down and they just chow down on aphids. Um, so it's all about that healthy balanced food web and ecosystem. If you have a good balance, you should not have out of control pest populations. It takes a little while to get there. Um, you may have a couple years in the beginning where you're really challenged to get rid of these pests, but over time with increased um, beneficial bugs, you'll have a lot better time both in your veg garden and in your, your native plant garden. Rattlesnake master is the host plant for the rattlesnake master borer moth, a very specific micro moth uh, relationship. 
uh, Culver's root, which is a great pollinator plant. It stays compact and it's just really lovely um, host plant for the Culver's root borer moth. And, um, you know, any of those plant species are really, are really great to include in your yard. There's so many more that I couldn't possibly get through all of them. Um, but really what I want to close with here is just um, part of this gardening for wildlife is all about kind of letting nature do a little bit of the work. You know, by planting native plant species, you're encouraging different insects, you're feeding at all levels of the food chain. So you're feeding from down to the smallest insects, microbes in the soil, all the way up to, you know, birds, mammals, and the, some of those megafauna. And by embracing the mess of a native plant garden, and when I say mess, I mean more, you know, don't be so eager in the spring to chop back all of the stems of all of the plants that you've left over the winter. Um, you know, leave them up, leave the seed heads, leave the stems up over the winter. It'll provide some winter interest when we don't really have a lot going on in the garden. You know, I'll look out my window and see just like a drab gray afternoon with very little snow, um, very little to look at. And knowing that I have some of that structure in the garden of some native grasses, some native plants with um, seed and stems attached. Um, I see birds come to my cone flowers and my ironweed all winter long, and they really love it. Um, you know, leaving some bare patches of ground, so ground nesting bees have a place to, to nest. Um, leaving insect galls, like the one down in the bottom middle here, as a nursery for some of those predatory wasps, um, some of the predatory insects in your garden. Um, creating a place where there's a little bit of a longer grass is going to give you lots of fireflies, which we desperately need to improve their populations. Um, it's going to give you more of the bee populations. The surfid flies love my bee lawn that I have in the back, and that way I provide more for them um, and get more opportunity for them to eat my aphids when I have a problem. Um, so in the spring, you know, after multiple 50 degree days is when you should begin to clean up brush and deadhead plants. I like to give animals a little bit of time to wake up, move around, find food, and um, you know, then they don't need that shelter so much that they had to depend on all winter long. Um, so I leave a small brush pile in the back next to my compost. Um, I know that there's a place I put a board down and we have lots of garter snakes, which I understand that not everyone likes snakes, but at the end of the day, you know, we don't have snakes here that are um, venomous or dangerous. So um, I leave a, a flat board in a section of my yard and I lift it up and I'll see, you know, six to eight snakes in there some days. And um, they are predatory too. So they'll eat lots of different insects around the yard. Um, also, um, I see a comment that says, I mentioned fireflies, what types of plants support fireflies? So fireflies um, overwinter in the ground as larvae and then they emerge and the male fireflies actually, I, I'm pretty positive, don't eat. Um, so female fireflies actually will eat other insects. So we are not necessarily feeding fireflies by providing that habitat. We are um, providing habitat for them. So in a very short cut lawn, you're not going to have that area that they prefer. They prefer some shorter grasslands. That's why you'll see them a lot in agricultural fields because they have kind of that like soybean fields actually are, um, I see a lot of fireflies out there. And the more diverse type of layering of that vegetation in your yard, the more types of fireflies and insects you're gonna get. I see at least two species here. Um, there are some hot spots of firefly diversity like in, the, um, in Florida. Florida has great firefly diversity, um, but we do have at least two species here. I know Appalachia has a huge diversity of um, fireflies as well. Um, but yeah, leaving, leaving some of the seeds, leaving some of the fruit, leaving some of that mess is gonna provide better habitat all around. And it doesn't necessarily need to come at the expense of having a nice looking yard. You can you know, structure these in ways that, you know, say you have a section behind the garage that you don't really, not many people see, put a brush pile back there. Um, and you can always decide that in, the, in certain times of the year, like in the late summer, early fall, you know, take it, remove it, burn it back, whatever, and then rebuild it in another way if it's starting to look ratty. Um, but I think it's good to have some of this variety in your yard. Most people's yards and lawns are just devoid of habitat whatsoever. You know, having those layers of vegetation, trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants, um, a short lawn, and a long lawn um, 
they're going to provide all different layers for these creatures that really need that diversity. And um, by doing that, you're going to increase those beneficial bugs. It's going to be better for your vegetables, your native plants. It's going to be better for the birds. Um, just good for everyone all around. So here are some resources for native plants, um, two of which are, or a couple of which are local. I also really like the National Audubon website. They have a native plants website where you can put in your zip code and find out what plants are native to your area. They will um, give you suggestions for if you have a place that's shady or sunny or whatever that may be. Um, they'll give you suggestions based on where you live and what types of birds you're looking to attract. And a lot of the information I got about the um, host species interactions are uh, from this Evergreen Native Plant Database, which is actually Canadian, um, but it's a really good plant database that gives you a lot of information about. So say you have, um, you know, Queen of the Prairie, Philopendra rubra, rubra in your backyard, and you're like, I want to know what insects depend on that plant. You can go to this plant database, you can look it up and you can find out at least what they know, what, what is recorded um, at this point in time. Prairie Moon is also a great native lo local plant nursery. It's, um, I believe, in Minnesota, um, but they sell local ecotype seeds so you can get things for short or tall prairie. Um, again, you can put in your requirements and they will, um, you know, put new things. Um, also, some people have local native plant sales, so keep your, your, your eyes open for that. Um, and I know there's some other local, I think there's like a, a prairie nursery nearby, um, Pitso natives up in Chicagoland, you know, so it's, it's, if you're looking for some, there are places that you can, you can go, but they're fewer and farther between, unfortunately. Um, and so by putting pressure on your local nurseries saying, hey, I'd really love it if you could carry some of these plants, you know, maybe you won't think much would happen if just one person went, but if everybody here went or, you know, everybody who cared about it went and, and asked them to provide some of those, then maybe we'd have better luck. Um, here are some books that I recommend if this interests you and you want to read more. Um, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Talami is one that I recommend. Of course, he also has a new book called Nature's Best Hope that just came out. Both are excellent um, and really just in a very digestible format uh, for anyone who's, who's new to plants. Um, Gardening for the Birds, uh, attracting wildlife to your backyard gives you really cool little monthly projects on what you can set up in your yard. Um, Ecology for Gardeners by Steve Carroll. And Pollinators of Native Plants is another really great one that doesn't just focus on butterflies and bees. You know, it focuses on a lot of different insects. Um, so I highly recommend that book as well. And um, if anyone has any questions, I will... Um, take off the mute and you guys can ask questions. You're also welcome to just put it in the chat if, if you would like to do that and you don't want to talk. Any questions? I, I can hear you. I have a question. Sure. Uh, but it's more, uh, what animal is doing this? Mm, okay. Uh, I have um, crab apple trees in my yard that had a lot of berries. And of course, in the spring, a lot of robins came in and ate them. Mm -hmm. But some animal that still uh, is picking up these berries, I think um, chopping them up a bit and then putting them in a little pile next to my brick wall the right angle of my brick wall and there's a pile there I remove it and then these berries come there again and I'm wondering what's doing this I have squirrels and rabbits around my place and I'm in the country and I yeah. wonder if you have any ideas yeah I would say um it's probably squirrels um we have a lot of squirrels in our area um you know we have particular issues with squirrels and I'm sorry if I just unmute, if I muted everybody, but if you could unmute yourself when you want to talk, that would be helpful just because there is some other noise going on in the background. Um, but yeah, I'm going to guess it's squirrels. I mean, we have a decent amount of squirrels in our yard. Many of them are problematic and there's honestly not too much you can do about them. I mean, I try to use negative reinforcement. So like when I see one outside on my feeder, I run outside and scare them away. 
but uh, there's only so much you can do when it comes to stuff like that. Um, I protect anything that I don't want to be eaten by rabbits or squirrels. So I use um, like chicken wire or plastic netting to protect any plants that I don't want nibbled. Um, but when it comes to a tree, that might be tough because, you know, you can't net the whole tree. I mean, hypothetically, you could net the whole tree. And some people do that. Um, like nurseries that grow uh, fruit trees, they will actually net the whole tree so that they can keep those those cherries from being eaten. Oh, but, it, but it's okay. They're picking up these berries, perhaps even from the ground. And uh, I didn't know squirrels ate crab apple berries and would store these. Oh, yeah, of course. they eat, They eat whatever they can find. They will eat um the roots of plants they will eat the stems of plants they eat mushrooms they eat berries they eat they are definitely omnivores and they are opportunists so they will eat anything i would say it's it's also possible there's chipmunks i mean we don't have a lot of chipmunks in town there's some at UC, of course um if you're near a natural area it's definitely possible you've got chipmunks as well <laughs> okay thank you yeah no problem any other questions Um, if you do have a question, you want to talk, just unmute yourself, and then um, I should be able to hear you, no problem. Um, you mentioned uh, cardinal flowers or lobelia being very good. I find it difficult to maintain these because they just, some of them die and you, they don't come up the next year. That's a good point. Yeah, there's actually a lot of uh, native plants that I've found that do that. So, for example, um, we have had a lot better... So for the last two years, we've had Lobelia syphilitica, which is the blue. It comes back. Um, cardinal flower, the red variety, I think is a little, they're both because they like wet areas, a little sensitive to that moisture change. So if we have a year that's really dry, um, you probably have to water them a lot more. Um, but there's a lot of plants that I've planted, one of which I mentioned was the wild columbine. There are some species that are just short-lived. So they aren't long-lived perennials and they will need to be replanted or reinvigorated with new seed or new plant stock every few years. Uh, another example I planted a couple of years ago is downy woodmint, um, which is a blophilia uh, in the genus blophilia. I can't remember the species name, but we planted that two years ago. It looked amazing for two years in the front and back garden. And this year they're all gone. And, you know, it's not like it's been a rough year. We've had amazing spring with cool temps and lots of rain, and we had a really mild winter. So um, there's just some plants that, yeah, you're going you're gonna to have to replant. Um, and I think cardinal flower is definitely one of them. Cardinal flower, columbine, um, some, of, some of the maybe ten, more tender perennials is something to think about. And yes, Jackie, I will, um, I have recorded this and I will upload a copy of this to uh, the Champaign County Audubon YouTube and then I will send it out to anyone who registered by email and I'll also post it to our Facebook and uh, probably send it to Bird Notes and various other places to view after the fact. Any other questions? I've got, I've got some time, so if you, um, if you have any, don't be afraid to ask. other questions? Okay, well that's fine. Um, you guys all have my email address, so... Um, Sarah? Oh, go ahead. Sarah, this is Sue Smith. Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Doing well, how are you? Good. Um, I thought I would go ahead and ask, um, I'm more really interested in the spice bush. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I'm wondering if you or anybody knows of a local source where you can find that native shrub. I think it's really valuable and would love to be able to grow that in our yard. Yes, I agree. You know, I don't know of a native, of a local source. Uh, the only thing that I know of is that the Illinois Native Plant Society typically will sell shrubs at their annual sale, but I believe the annual sale has already passed. Um, but I would say they would be a good resource to reach out to. Um, 
you know, someone in the chapter and say, do you know anyone who, who has it locally? Um, there may be some people who have some in their yard uh, and, and sprout readily. So it may be worth asking around via bird notes or, or somewhere similarly. Um, I have, I know that it can be propagated from cuttings. So if you know a friend that has some, I tried last fall to take a cutting and root it in soil and I was not successful, unfortunately. Um, oh yes, and uh, Master Naturalist extension tree and shrub sale that I forgot about. Um, but um, again, I, I, I personally wasn't successful, but it could be that I did it at the wrong time of the year. Um, could be that, um, you know, they, they'd rather be taken from softwood than hardwood cuttings, um, which is probably likely, but I bet you, you could get a lot of plants if you start some cuttings and do it the right way, not the wrong way like I did. <laughs> but yeah, they're lovely plants. And I, again, I, I really encourage everyone to, uh, you know, apply some pressure to local nurseries because, um, wouldn't it be great if you could just go to the nursery? I, I find myself at the nursery regularly saying, oh, how boring. You know, I've seen all these plants for years and years and years, and I would love to see something different. Um, so yeah, encouraging more nurseries and places to sell better plants that our ecosystems want and that we want. So any other questions? Thank you guys for all the comments. Yeah, there's lots of great um, local resources that I often forget about. Um, you know, I've been here for five years and I still feel like a new person in the area. There's, um, you know, a lot to, a lot of resources around here that are really wonderful. So um, good to have people like you guys who care and are interested and really wanna make, make better ecosystems for, for everybody. Okay. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I will end the presentation, but I really appreciate you guys coming. The sun is coming out, so everybody get outside and enjoy it if you can. Um, and everyone take care, and I'll send out the details of this presentation after the fact. So enjoy. thank you very much. Thank you.